think it actually says Maybe. Hi. So while I was applying in graduate school, uh, I was finding myself auditing in class back in my old undergraduate uh, university. And so I was auditing font filtering with a class group class. And I just remember one thing from the class that I forgot mentioning, which was symmetry. And so uh, what I'll do today is that, so, so the step is that, that there's a long-standing puzzle, well, there was a long-standing puzzle about the heterotic string about uh, what happens when an instant time shrinks its size to zero, and what happens to that singularity. And so, um, so for example, for the yang mills field instant time, this is the form of the uh, yang mills instant time. So uh, this is the potential. So uh, this is a solution, and so what's important is that, you know, when rho to zero, and that's a singularity, and then when R goes to zero, then that's a singularity. And so, uh, we, have a, oh, we kind of have a picture for the angle of this time, like, like this. And then there's a singularity there. And it's not satisfying, it's just to simply say that this is a mathematical singularity. We can try to explain what goes on. So you're drawing a modular space in so, yeah. yeah, so what are those parameters? I mean, there are far too many of them. What's important is the size of the instant time. Okay, R so. Is, uh, position. So uh, R this will be a position. Okay. Then what's rho? Does it uh, oh, oh, so, uh, size of the instant time. Okay, and R is just space time distance to the origin of the instant yeah. time? Okay, and then there is a tau and an m. Oh, here. With three indices? Three indices. Mm -hmm. uh, mu, if I believe correctly, uh, uh, it's just a uh, uh, vector indice. So what yeah, does uh, it uh, it's Some kind of invariant uh, symbol. Uh, okay. X mu would simply be yeah. uh, zip, where exactly in space time is time vector. Yeah. What's important is uh, this part. I was being pedantic. So uh, what's important is uh, when rho uh, goes to zero, and then so we have a singularity at r equals zero. So Yang was missing times um, a canonical Yang gauge field. So uh, exactly as Ed said, if r is a radius in four dimensional space, there's just this solution that looks like lump. If rho is the size, exactly as Ed said, it, you can see that both r and rho go to zero. It's a big spike, you know. So if rho is finite, you take r to zero, you've got the picture you've just drawn, you've got a nice finite lump, because rho is still on zero. But if rho goes to zero, and then you look at r equals zero, there's a, why can you get a big spike in the gauge field? And the problem is, is that these solutions that were produced in Yang Mills, they exist in magnetic string theory. So what happens to that spike is it's supposed to be infinite. And so, and Witten in and what I'll present to you today is that for many <laughs> symmetry arguments, uh, we're going to uh, discover that uh, what happens when we shrink the instant time is that uh, we pick up an extra SU2 uh, gauge symmetry and it then it will smooth out the singularity. And, and we're, uh, we're going to get out an extra SU2 uh, gauge symmetry. And the argument mainly is just uh, symmetry argument, just simply arguing from symmetry uh, why we pick up this SU2 uh, extra, extra gauge symmetry when we shrink the instant time. Okay, so the setup is going to be we're going to have a SO32 uh, heterotic string compacted on R6 across K3. K3 is a Hunter-Taylor manifold. Now, one reason for Choosing the SO32 uh, heterotic string is that it allows for the uh, maximal supersymmetry. So uh, K3, uh, the compactification of K3 is going to uh, break the uh, supersymmetry in half, and then so we're left with a SO1 top five.
There's also the smallest amount of super terminals that would be allowed for uh, six D uh, space time. Okay, now usually for uh, and, and then so also for our setup, uh, the space time connection is going to be six. Okay, usually for D equals six, uh, we would have telegraphic n is one C D. But uh, for D equals four, with space time, uh, it's just going to be Telegraphic uh, equals two supersymmetric two D. So we're going to go with that because that gives us time to do the test. So yeah, telegraphic n equals two uh, two D, uh, while d equals six. Um, special ability to the right. So this is I should this catches out people with left right centers. So when people say n equals two C D in six dimensions, that they often mean the minimal magic supersymmetry. Now we have, uh, let, let's say we have uh, k hypermultiplets. Uh, we don't know what k is right now. So k hypermultiplets uh, in this cluster neonic uh, manifold. Uh, the, these k hypermultiplets are going to transform this way uh, in the symplectic k2 cross SU2 or 2k uh, cross 2. So the, the SU2 is just the R symmetry, right? Or? Yeah. Okay. So um, these k hypermultiplets should be uh, living in some kind of uh, and not uh, quaternionic manifold that's like a r to the four k. Uh, the four. So we have k hypermultiplets. Uh, the four comes from because there are going to be uh, four scalars for the hypermultiplets, and, and then so yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. For each hypermultiple, uh, there, there are going to be um, n equals one, uh, two little chiral multiples. And then, so each of them is going to have four little chirals. Each of them have one complex chiral. So, again, it's this relationship why they call it n equals two supersymmetry. The way you think about it is hey, if it was in four dimensions, I had n equals one supersymmetry, I have two chiral multiples, two little scalar. The extra supersymmetry in four dimensions. Bosonic part of the hypermultiplets, let's just write it as capital H to the uh, XA, uh, X and Y being the symplectic indices, and then A and B being the uh, spinner indices for SU ER. So the reality condition is just simply um, how much time to get X to the subscript XA equals gamma subscript XY, S1 subscript AB, H uh, subscript YB. Gamma is an anti-symmetric tensor of symplectic case. And then, ah, so now let's just say there's a K through capital G of the subset of uh, symplectic case that we're going to divide uh, by. So let's, let's say that the generators of this uh, K through G, oh, by the way, we don't know what G is. So what you're doing here is you're writing out a general n equals two CDD in six D. I'm just thinking of this stuff about the Yes. So K is left arbitrary because we're just thinking of arbitrary number hypermultiple. G is left arbitrary because we're thinking of arbitrary geometry. Okay. Specify this up. Exactly. So to so say that the generators of K group is going to be um, T to the A, uh, A rank from one to D, uh, D. Now I'm denoting small D now I'm denoting T to the A, X, Y are uh, symmetric second rank tensors uh, in the joint representation of uh, the symplectic case. So it has to belong to the symplectic case. Uh, okay, so here's the reality condition for that generator. Uh, time to get T 
which is how since the A capital X Y is equal to gamma to the X minus prime, gamma of Y to the Y prime, uh, capital C is equal to A times Y prime. Okay, so for every t uh, today, uh, define a d field and define it in such a way. So again, there's no real con uh, controversy. So uh, this form of the d field uh, d to the a uh, a b equals to the sum of uh, this t times x times x uh, over x and y, right? Dimension indices. The symmetry defines a form of the form of the d field. And then so from our previous reality conditions, uh, we can also have the conjugate of d, uh, conjugate of d to the superscript a d equals epsilon d d, uh, epsilon uh, superscript d d, d uh, superscript a and c d. Okay. And then so we can obtain a scalar potential b So I'll, I'll include the gauge coupling in epsilon a uh, for the general top. So for the scalar potential, it's going to be the, the sum of the, uh, the square of these d fields uh, times one will factor of one over two epsilon to a for each d field. Uh, a is running from one to d for the that a group that we don't know. Okay. So to determine the space of the moduli. Set D equal zero. Okay. Would someone like to tell me what D would equal? So D would equal zero. And then that would go into this. Okay, great. So, so I, I, I would simply like to emphasize that so far, you know, in the right of this, uh, we just considered the N equals two to Z. Gauge group G and its symmetry. And then to turn it out as a form of our scalar potential. Okay. That's a really good point to make, Sandra. So if you were in N one season of four D, this symmetry arguments would be completely determined to be with the zero bit of your terms wouldn't have been enough, right? You could have a super potential. If you're given the gauge symmetry, you might have shared by the super potential, so you could then use different factor spaces. There's no such choice here, and essentially with one cheat. Written on the board, everything has been determined by the gauge symmetry. So that's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. So, this theory is not. so what, what was the choice we got rid of the super potential? It was choosing SO32? Uh, no. Any N equals 2? So at this point, uh, well, we've determined uh, d equals zero is for moduli, and so our moduli space, which I will denote as telegraph again. Okay, so the dimension of this moduli space. Uh, 
the notation would be uh, the small d would be for uh, the input g. All right. So uh, why four uh, four here instead of just you know minus d? Well, it's because in um, supersymmetry we do a gauge transformation. When I when I was taking supersymmetry, when I was both auditing supersymmetry and when I was taking supersymmetry, uh, like the moral of the story seems to be like um, if you have a gauge parameter or some parameter. Advance it into a super field or a super multiple of some kind. So um, in the uh, Hecker multiple, there are uh, four four time scalars, so we're going to multiply that four times. Okay. Yeah. So the vacua um, for which the instantons are embedded so to say it's uh, okay, so S O N and it's going to be a subgroup of this S O N which is previous header. Still don't even know what that answer is. Alright, so I'm going to make a few comments about our set. Sorry, just so I get this straight. So you're saying the if I take all the vacua in which I have an instanton, then this set is invariant under SON transformations or what does it mean vacuum for which instant tons embedded is S O N? It's called base D for S O N Yes. And now I'm gonna take this graph that I just gave you on a bunch of instant tons on my lip. Yes. To ask which part of S O plus G do my instant tons live in. So we're gonna live in an S O N subgroup. So is it the unbroken part of the group or well the unbroken part of the group is then the constant, yeah, is that constant of S O N. The instantons are valued in this SON, and so those gauge fields fit, if you like, that SON structure. Okay, thanks. Oh, thanks. Okay. So I'll make a few comments about our setup. All right, so uh, when the inciton shrinks to zero, the details of our K3 manifold uh, become irrelevant because we're shrinking the instantons down to zero. And so the instanton may as well be embedded in our bulk. Also, once an instanton shrinks away, then we should recover back our SON uh, gauge parameter is left, and, and the instanton number will be uh, 23. Because uh, we started with uh, 24 instantons. I can make a comment about that later. And the whole details are of the rest of the manifold is uh, irrelevant for the interpretation of our point instanton so, uh, shrinking one instanton simply uh, furnishes a mechanism for completely breaking this SON 23. So the result is instead of thinking about like the K3 manifold, then we simply think about the uh, one instanton problem uh, shrinking the size to zero uh, in our bulk. Okay, so uh, for a pure SUN gauge tree, then um, the action is described in Euclidean space time is as follows. Okay, so where the field stream.
simply writing all this down, just in case you haven't seen that. That's your mind gauge theory, and then seeing where this comes from. Okay, and then the board. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to see what I So when we're talking about this, so when we're uh, talking about these time catalysts, then it's very useful to listen to um, well, a quaternion uh, notation, and so quaternion notation for four-dimensional Euclidean space time. All right. So uh, just recall that you know for the SO four, then uh, the covering group is. Anything, uh, funny notation thing, uh, just keep in mind. Is, uh, I'm going to call something called uh, sigma hat to be essentially the closest time by i times the usual power matrices. Uh, k is the one from 0 to 3. Okay, and then so now suppose there are uh, four real parameters. Uh, we've got to show only three of them to be independent. Uh, and Maybe just yeah. one question. Uh -huh. Why do we care about SO4 right now? I mean, it's something I can look at if I want, but oh. what will oh. we do with that? Or oh, why do I care? You want to defense my analysis. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting it. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's basically because you're in the book space, right? So. Yeah. Okay. That again.
It's an interesting thing that you do. It's, it's, it's the county makes these arms again in some cases, but um, you can also you know, put that to buy and that in the event you know, to actually build the unit for the purpose itself. That is kind of what we So, what do we know about unit type in this case? <laughs> <laughs> Standards look like uh, it's like a four vector these uh, groups here. Okay, great. All right, so okay, uh, and, and in terms of these uh, base uh, elements, uh, I'm going to define the uh, lens band motion. relevant is that uh, you can solve for the previous action, S A, and then get uh, the solution for the instant time, which is going to be the following. This goes as uh, one over x, uh, one over x, and so if, if any time in the future we want to work with any kind of squared interval uh, quantity, we would like to have something that goes with uh, one over x cubed. So uh, what we can do is make it a singular, uh, singular uh, unit, unit, unitary uh, base transformation. Uh, we we'll simply make a singular uh, unitary gate transmission. Uh, we'll work up that quickly. Is that we make obtain an expression that we want to uh, like this for the solution of the instant time. So you just take the instant solution for the gate. Switch and gauge to get some nice property and advancing out the answer. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and again, you know, what's really important is just honestly this part. Uh, rho squared as unit type of stuff. Uh, you know, when rho goes to zero and looking at uh, you know, when rho goes to zero, z 
singularity because we're small f equals f and blow up. Yeah, but it's a row in the numerator, so. <coughs> yeah. But this so doesn't appear in the singularity? Nope. So basically, it's created a single, a bad behavior at infinity for a bad behavior at zero, but no, basically I, just changing. If I okay. imagine if I hate, I hate the zero, right? let's look at this one. So if I take um, row to zero in this one, then I basically get x over x squared. Which is? So it goes singular as I go to the origin. So this is a lumpy gauge field that's spiked at the origin. Here, in the second gauge, yeah, the second. we honestly just multiply by one. Yeah. On both sides. But here in this gauge, we've got, if we take row goes to zero, um, well, it depends which limit we do first. Yeah. Right? Um, let's take Rho, uh, x goes to zero before we take rho goes to zero. If we do that, uh, x goes to zero uh, is even quicker than rho, so we get rho squared over rho squared, that cancels, and then we have x over x squared, which gives us one over x. So just play around with the different orders in which you take rho to zero and x to zero, and you'll find this is at least as spiky as that dude, basically. <laughs> so whatever you do, if you take rho to zero and x to zero, you've got Two, four powers of zero on the bottom, and three powers of zero on the top. So whatever happens, this is spiky. Okay, okay so the thing to notice about this guy right here is uh, this is way down. Consider a uh, constant unitary. <coughs> All right, so, all right, say uh, this is uh, some unitary uh, transformation. Yeah. Oh, okay, some unitary transformation, and then so um, this will, uh, this unitary transformation will transform into another uh, solution to, uh, for, for the modulus group, so, you know, like, uh, so, so maybe it, it goes to another, uh, Solution of our moduli space, you know, transforming. Okay. Um, what the thing to notice is that. Perhaps so before you, you do the next one, it's, it's useful to have just sorry, it's useful to have a physical picture in mind as what's going on. So you've got a modulus, a parameter in the solution already, which is the size of this. Mm -hmm. right, so you've got this long gauge field coming into this parameter. It's just an integration. Yeah. Yeah. So we're doing the gradient. Which is just like, there's an integration constant in the solution, which is the size of your line. Awesome. Now he's saying, hey, do a, an SU2 transformation on this gauge field. Here is gauge invariant, that's still going to be a solution. So I've got an SU2 band of gauge field, rotate it in SU2, and I can get new solutions. Right, so there's three SU2 parameters, so then he's drawing the space of the parameter space of solutions. Um, and as you say, you've got theta going round and rho going on radially up in the space of the parameters. Yeah. And so that's what, that's what we're doing here. And the thing, uh, and then now the thing to notice is that um, so uh, you therapy you go five. The, uh, the thing to notice is that um, that will give us one uh, moduli solution, and also. Theta i is a negative, a negative times a negative, you get 
other. And so that would bring us to the same moduli solution. So effectively, um, if we rotate and this it's a two phase by hot, simply just high, uh, then we get back the same solution. So what we're doing is identifying um, zero and pi. So for instance, you know, you have a piece of paper and it says we're identifying uh, so you know this is from zero to pi and so we're identifying both these points. And so what we simply get is a what Whitney calls a conical. And, okay, so the structure group for our one on one instant is going to be SU2. And this is going to refer to, and just correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the, this, what we will call the SU2 orientation, which is, yeah. you know, we've been talking about theta this entire time. So now, uh, remember we were talking about SON. That's fine. Yeah. So we were talking about SON. So we want to think about, you know, uh, what's, what would be the maximal subgroup uh, that would commute with S2? And so uh, that would be the, the answer. Maximum subgroup that would commute. So, uh, and again, when I say commute, that's simply like what that means is that you know uh, you have this S O N, and so um, when I mean commute, then you just have S O four and S O N minus four, and then so they're in separate blocks, and they don't talk to each other. So, so this is a maximum subgroup that. Would you know, and also notice, let's see, we were talking about um, SO4, yeah. Right, so so we could think of like, um, first SON is uh, SO4 cross uh, SO N minus four, and then uh, then that's isomorphic to SO2 cross SO2. And so this first one will be the structure of K of our uh, one piece of time, and then uh, SU2 cross SO2. Okay. Oh. That's this is a good page to as well. So remember, we're putting our instant our instanton solution with bunny in here, logic. We're saying we've got lots of these instantons and they all lie in S to O N. And then you can ask, okay, what part of that S O N doesn't play with this particular one instanton that you're going to bring up? You've got this SU2 value plum. Which bits of the gauge group don't talk? So which bits of S O N rather don't talk to our SU2? Okay, uh, would someone like to venture uh, what the dimensions of SON are? Never ask me questions. No one ever asks. Okay. No problem. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, the dimensions of uh, SON, also the dimensions of V, uh, I'm sure it is. And, uh, uh, All right, I'm simply going to say that. Yeah, uh, when I was studying for my undergrad, like, it would give um, Canadian dollars for every time a student answers. <laughs> no, I'm for real. Yeah. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I don't have that money right now. But. <laughs> okay, so S O N uh, equals uh, N times N minus 2. Okay, and so the dimension of S O N minus 4 is uh, simply uh, you would uh, simply plug in uh, N minus 4 in here. So, uh, if, if you take uh, the dimension of uh, SON, uh, what we're aiming at is trying to get uh, the dimensions of the moduli group. Back by the dimension of SON minus 4 and SU2 and SU2. All right, the dimension of uh, SU2 is simply uh, 3 squared minus 1 and squared times 1. Uh, we're going to subtract by this uh, part. All right. Um, 
for our initial time, we're going to have H3 for a parameter uh, because rho is a parameter. We have four of where uh, of, of the baseline position of our instant time, so that's not four free parameters, one plus four, and then plus three, uh, because we have three independent uh, theta parameters, so we're going to get eight. So we're going to add that eight, and then we're going to get um, for the dimension of the module.
So for the physical key, that's row 32 has a lot of strings. So when an instanton shrinks to zero, uh, is that the singularity uh, that comes about a new SQ2 key symmetry that appears when this instanton shrinks away? Okay. Is there some way I can imagine that SQ2 sort of like now the features are not fixed anymore, or is there some way I can imagine how I get that apart from well now the instanton's gone, but. I mean, he's done it for centuries. So no one knew, right? No one knew what. So you know that when a singularity happens in a moduli space in string theory, it is normally due to the presence of extra massless stuff. Yep. What Ernest has shown us is that because everything can turn to D terms and gauge symmetries in N plus 2 supersymmetry, the only way things can get mass is the Higgs mechanism. So if you want something to get mass, or more importantly, use this mass as you go to the point, it has to be the Higgs mechanism. So we must have some gauge group G that's involved in the Higgs mechanism if we're going to get a singularity in modular space and then it resolves itself to the mass of stuff. Uh, and have multiple Higgs mechanisms? Yeah, so we've got N high bodies and a G is SU2. And the extra mass of stuff, for example, would be the SU2 gauge bosons as you go to the point where the, the Higgs field has been turned off. But as for the rest, well, all Whitney's done is said, hey, the dimension of the moduli space is k minus d for one of these um, theories. That's just by symmetry. If you have k hypermultiple, it's a, a dimension d. That's, that's what it is. Um, the dimension of the moduli space in the angle is instanton is proportional to n minus 3. So I need n minus 3 to be equal to k minus d. I have this SON symmetry, and I expect my fields to transform under them. So it's got to be an n so they can transform properly. So I've got n fields, so I need dimension d equals three gauge groups exactly, as I said. So what dimension d do I have gauge groups going on? I know it's two. Right down the theory, n modulized space is the same. As Mr. Bernard said at the start, symmetry is power. This is the only thing you can write down with this theory. Yes. Uh, physically, where does it come from? Well, that's a hard question. Yeah, <laughs> because it's non terminal for string theory. I think maybe you're going to say something about this. Yeah, uh, eventually I'll. Uh, I'm going to make comments. Uh, it doesn't rise from formal Euclid. Okay, so this was the meat of it. So we can talk about how it arises from the uh, ether. So uh, with our new common knowledge, So I began uh, way up there uh, with the D fields, and then we were writing them in terms of uh, some vector game, uh, NC, and then I believe uh, some, some spinner NC. So from our new <laughs> knowledge about uh, SOM, uh, we can relabel these NCs. So let's just start from the bosonic part of the, those hypermultiple. Symmetric in uh, A prime, E prime, and also symmetric in A. 
A and B. Um, because this is in, in both the adjoint representation of B and these two objects. Okay. So now uh, then, then we did all that. And then as we worked out, uh, we, we had a, we had a sheet. And as we have, so, so we have uh, SO, SON, uh, and then we, uh, we shrunk the instanton to uh, zero size, and then get back to uh, gate one or SON, and then cross SU2 to zero, uh, a two. And so we can even go ahead and rewrite uh, these H's. And, and so it, these H's do transform as N comma 2. Sorry, N comma 4. I guess you're combining the SU2 with an SU2. With, with that uh, SU2R. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. An SU2 with SU2. And then so we can even further uh, rewrite H to be uh, I and alpha, alpha running and four. Okay, so what we can think about is that um, for a fixed alpha, these H's, so, so say we had a copy, like say a B uh, of uh, Euclidean R to the fourth. And so just think of B as a copy of that, but it transforms as N. And so we can think of each of these uh, H components for some alpha to, to be components of this vector that transforms like N uh, and B. And so they should be uh, so if we divide by the sum constant, same row, I, I know it's the same symbol for the side chain. Uh, just some constant that we could uh, reobtain some orthonormal vectors. The alpha. So you're just parameterizing the solutions to the D terms. So is that the, the solutions right. to the D terms of some, say, E alphas, the, the H alpha, as it were. Right, some constant. And you can choose any of those. Right. Now, uh, DC, uh, B alphas, uh, they're going to depend on uh, three parameters, and then they're, they're going to correspond to what I call the SU2 orientation over KI. Uh, and then so that's going to be the uh, SU2, the structure group, uh, K equals SU2 structure group. And then that, as we've talked about, commutes with, um, again, So we can think about it that um, you know the space that's spanned by these uh, four orthonormal vectors that are going to uh, break SOM into uh, break it down to SOM on four. So in other words, you're just saying if you look at the solution of the D term and you get this solution space of the fields of the solution of the D term, you're just saying look, it's the same as the moduli space of the N. Right, because uh, yeah, this condition becomes equal to D equals zero uh, becomes uh, only 
it's a fun thing to plot it. So you're saying these orthonormal vectors are just, if alpha is not equal to b over beta, and the orthonormal vectors, the constant is clearly the size of the vectors in terms of the size, this row, mm -hmm. and then the other one, and this one too. Yeah. Yeah. All right, great. Um, so finally, I, I just want to uh, make you uh, So, so uh, we've got, uh, we've both, uh, again, I'll reiterate, we've obtained this uh, extra edge in two case numbers by shrinking the instantons. And so consider the extreme case of shrinking all the 24 instantons uh, down to zero. And then so suppose they're all in distinct uh, points at different points. And um, so that leaves us with, uh, so say we uh, shrink all 24 instantons. So as we uncovered today, uh, we get back an extra two, extra uh, data seventeen for each of them. So we're going to have extra two, uh, two to twenty four. Okay, so uh, we so we shrunk them all back. We get back so and uh, two twenty four. And so if you calculate the center charge for you know, for quantum physics, then you get something like uh, at least greater than forty. Non-determinative phenomenon that we see at the quantum level. So you're saying if these gauge groups couldn't be part of the excitation, so two G complete here for each of those states. Yep. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, finally, I, would, I simply want to say that uh, because of the local nature of the of what we've done with uh, shrinking the instantons, and we didn't care about the details of K three. Then um, this should apply to the uh, Fuji angle uh, instanton, you know, uh, that's embedded in any 10 manifold. So in this case, interpret uh, such an instanton as a heterotic string five uh, tr uh, string solitonic five ring. And so the instanton scale size would be kind of like the th thickness of our uh, And so. For our result, it implies that in the limit of uh, field thickness, the five ring would uh, carry a previously unknown HG group H temperature, along with those sort of seven small capital one multiple. Great, uh, thank you. And now, um, let's see, uh, why 24 instantons? Uh, it's because when you do the heterotic string and then you know, have anomaly cancellation, then I'm not too clear about it myself, but uh, you know, if you start from the Bianchi, I think. And uh, you integrate both sides. So let's assume I don't care about string theory. <laughs> I know, it's a mild sign. So then, I mean, most of what you told us I could still use, right? I mean, most of that, really, there was nothing string theory specific going in there. I just took supersymmetric young mills, looked at the instantons. So basically, like, and then I get an out the new gate symmetry. So it's not really important that the young mills is something I get from string theory, right? So what you're saying is you want to say, I'm going to write down a supersymmetric gauge theory 
the moduli space reproduces moduli space at the end of this time. I don't give a reason to go up. Yes. Who does? As long as you start with um, some equation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean so I can still that. start with the same group, sure. Now that is an excellent point you just made. The group that you start with matters. So let me give you an example of where there is some kind of influence on where you can go with specifics. So only start it here very specifically, state very clearly that he's doing S yes. thirty two hypothesis string. There's another hypothesis string that's doing the ATH. If he tried to do the same thing, everything would have gone. So he did all this matching of the dimension of the moduli space, there wouldn't have been a group of the right dimension there. It just simply did not have worked. So the input that's going in here is the amount of supersymmetry, the gauge group, and he happens to have taken those from a heterotic string because he wants to say there shouldn't be any singularities in the heterotic string, so it should work out in this case. He could have equally well done it in just pure gauge theory, in fact he did. But he had some input from string theory there just to check that the string theory itself is working. So what happens if I take the eight if that goes wrong? I mean, there, there was just start, right. instant. So the reason is, is uh, in the eight, the eight heterotic string, we still don't fully understand the smallness and composition because it involves a tensorless non critical string theory at the beginning of the system. So instead of just the extra light states being a Higgs effect, we get an SU2 particles, we get a six dimensional tensorless non critical string, or in particle language, an infinite number of particles in one part. Yeah, this is a real problem because unfortunately, So um, it's not the SH32 string that begins to describe our world as the A, the A one, so yeah, this actually becomes a problem in and of itself. But this one weirdly points out how you very nicely have to describe this in terms of just a supersymmetric heat effect in gauge theory. And that is a non-trivial thing that the interest in string theory, as, as Ernest pointed out, the SO32 gauge groups work. And there are other examples that we're going to this very closely then. So for example, if you wanted to tell me about a gang that was instant on So, and the SUs are similar, so they work? Or, I mean, SU is nothing I get from string theory, from heterotic, but that's from a field theory perspective, that would be kind of interesting. I guess it works with SU2, yeah. I'd expect it, but. Yeah. So, instead of a SO gauge group, I take an SU gauge group. Yeah, so it should work. Yeah. I think that's good. Maybe you have to recalculate Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think, think, I think okay. from a field theory perspective. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a similar text in the part one of part two fluids. Yeah. <laughs> so if not, let's thank him again.